That's the opening bell for Round by Round presented by Eastern Communications. Mabuhay Pilipinas! Welcome world! I'm Nisi Kashano. And I'm Ryan Sangalia. Boyd Sison joins us later on in the show. John Real Casimero has aired his frustration over the most recent purse bid of his next title defense. Casimero will put his WBO bantamweight title on the line against Paul Butler on December 11th. Casimero is expected to get 75% of the 105,000 purse bid won by Probellum, which was established most recently by Richard Schaefer. The promotion won the purse bid by only adding $5,000 to the WBO's required minimum amount of $100,000. Ryan, let's talk about Probellum first. Why do you think Schaefer did not go beyond $105,000 for this fight, considering, considering that Casimero is a fighter not that difficult to promote because of his style in the ring as well as his colorful personality? I mean, it's the same reason why when we go to the store mm-hmm. and there's a, you know, the, the price tag for an apple is a dollar, We don't give a dollar fifty, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you know, we can get away. Just get give a dollar. Um, there wasn't a huge demand for this fight. I don't think that uh, uh, people were saying, "Oh, we need to get that Casimero versus uh, Butler fight." If you can get that fight in the cheap, and there's not a lot of competition, um, that's what I, I figured they they thought. And also, Probellum, they're jumping right into the business. They're a new company. I know Richard Schaefer has a long time of experience in the yeah. sport, but they're establishing themselves. They won a purse bid like within weeks of being established, and uh, I figure that's what they were thinking. Ryan Casimero reportedly got a six-figure payday from the Guillermo Rigondo fight last August. For this bout against Butler, he will only get a little over seventy-eight thousand dollars. What's con- What's confusing on the part of Casimero is the fact that MP Promotions, TGB Promotions, uh, the promotions that. The, or the management that represents him, and even MTK Global did not make a bid for this one. What does this say when it comes to the value of Casimero as a fighter? And do you think the lackluster fight against Rigundo has a lot to do with that? Or is it simply because of Paul Butler? Uh, I don't think it helped. I don't think the Rigundo fight helped because a lot of people, like, there's this sort of double standard. It's like, Oh, well, you know, we expect Rick and Dow to be kind of a boring fighter. Uh, it's Casimero's fault. You know what I mean? But it's also kind of like a boxing hipster mentality. It's like, oh, um, what Rick and Dow is doing is, is, is genius. I'm like, we call it genius. I call it boring, right? Um, so Casimero kind of got a lot of that uh, heat, even though almost nobody looks good against Rick and Dow. And when Rick and Dow doesn't want to look good, he doesn't. No one looks good, but um, I think that you know that yeah that is kind of a problem unless unless because we don't know what Probellum's um, uh, relationship will be with Premier Boxing Champions. Mm-hmm. We don't know yet because we've seen a lot of different companies uh, work with uh, PBC as sort of like the promoter of record, and then PBC is really running the show behind the scenes. So. Mm-hmm. Um, MP Promotions has a relationship with uh, PBC. So does Tom Brown. Um, so, you know, in the past, we had seen Richard Schaefer work in, in uh, behind the scenes when he was still dealing with the, uh, the fallout of, you know, him leaving Golden Boy. Uh, he wasn't able to work, you know, on the front end, you know, but, you know, he had relationships with different boxers that they did business with. So, Um, yeah, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what Probellum does, who they work with. They, they, it does seem like they've been working with different promoters, mm-hmm. um, but will they kind of fall into the orbit of PBC? That would make that would that would help me understand better why 
um, MP Promotions uh, and TGB didn't make bids. Ryan, right now, with what Jean Riel Casimero established with his Angas ng Pinas persona, he gained a huge following of, of that. We cannot deny it anymore, especially on social media. Some would say it's not their cup of tea, but some would say it's time for Philippine boxing to have a boxer who doesn't come from the same mold of a typical Filipino boxer. You know what I mean? Now, from a business standpoint, with the clout that Casimero has at the moment, that's good investment. But do you think that's not enough at least to give Casimero another piece of the pie? I, I think it helps him. I think it helps him definitely because he's kind of broken out of that clone like model, you know, that really, and people say, oh, well, um, Filipino boxing fans, they, they like their fighters to be a certain way. I mean, yeah, that's cool. But if you're not like buying tickets and, you know, and, and not making the guy money, um, what does it matter? So like, you know, Casimero is figuring, Hey, I need to appeal to the broadest, um, you know, possible uh, fan base and that means making some noise, you know, closed mouths don't get fed. So I think he's doing the right things, but at the same time, he is a bantamweight and huh. it, it makes it harder to get your name out there because uh, at a certain point, like, you know, there's, first off, you're not going to find American fighters really at bantamweight, you know, so that you can't really, it's going to be harder to cross over. Hmm. Um, Casimero has is, is always been a road warrior. And I think that's sort of the, the way his career has will continue to go. And part of that is, you know, you, 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 you cash your checks where you can. Mm. Ryan, let's look for the silver lining here. Probellum won the first bid. Do you think it will be much easier for Casimero to land a fight with Donaire? Because Donaire has a working relationship with Richard Schaefer. I think he's had one for a long time. I think that it certainly helps his cause. Mm. I think that it signals at least something that they want to work together because Probellum, um, you know, Richard Schaefer has had a relationship with, with uh, Donaire for a long time. Like he was um, uh, in 2017, uh, Donaire had uh, signed with uh, Ringstar, which was the company that Richard Schaefer has. And yeah, so like, you know, the, I think that signals something, but I, I think at the end of the day, what will make that happen is business. If uh, Donaire can't get a, a rematch with Inoue, um, all of a sudden Casimero uh, is looking pretty good. It's time for our fearless forecast of the day, brought to you by Eastern Communications. On October 15, Emmanuel Nevarete of Mexico is set to defend his WBO featherweight championship against Mexican-American boxer Joet Gonzalez. The bout is set to take place at the Pechang Arena in San Diego, California. Navarrete is a two-division world champion who holds a record of 34-1 and with 29 victories by way of knockout. Meanwhile, Gonzalez owns a win-loss slate of 24-1 and with 14 wins by way of knockout. Ryan, your fearless forecast for this fight. My fearless forecast for this fight is I don't believe that anybody has the um, ability to keep up with his pace at, 100, at 126 pounds. I'm talking about Emmanuel Neverete. I think Neverete will uh, put a lot of pressure on, uh, on Gonzalez in the fight. You know, Gonzalez has some um, qualities that I think will lend himself well. Like he, I think, is a bigger fighter than Dog Bay was, mm -hmm. uh, than Villa was. Uh, those guys were really 118 pounders, 122 pounders. Uh, so he'll be able to stand up, I think, to the heat. I think that the pace, uh, you know, because Navarrete has this pace that's almost like Alexis Arguello. It's, you know, he starts slow and then he builds up tempo. Like, um, yeah, Juan Francisco Estrada is similar as well. You know, it's it's not how you start the fight, it's how he ends the fight. And, you know, I think that Neverete will be able to throw enough punches to to get through that fight and uh, with the victory. Uh, the interesting fact about the Pachanga Arena, when I went there to San Diego, it was just called the Arena, but that's the building where uh, Muhammad Ali lost to Ken Norton mm. uh, in the first fight when... Uh, when Ken Norton broke his jaw, uh, there's nothing outside of the arena you know, uh, celebrating that fight, which was a big win by a San Diego native. 
Um, but inside, uh, there's a little thing there that talks about it. So, Ryan, it's going to be by knockout or by decision in favor of Navarrete? I think I would think by decision. I think that Navarrete, uh, I think Gonzalez has enough professionalism and, and physical strength that he'll be able to stand up. And that's our Eastern Communications fearless forecast of the day. Manny Pacquiao will forever be remembered as one of the best boxers to ever do it. However, the journey came with a lot of challenges in the ring. Boxing's only eight-division world champion had faced eight losses in his 26-year professional career. Tonight on Round by Round, we will go through the setbacks that could have either brought out the best in Manny Pacquiao or posed the most stringent test. First on our list, Rustico Terocampo. Ryan, this was the first boxer who handed Manny Pacquiao his first loss by way of knockout in February of 1996. This was also the same guy who broke his who broke his 11 fight win streak. Ryan, there was already a chatter surrounding Manny Pacquiao at the time. But why but why do you think this knockout loss did not hinder his momentum? Well, I think it's because it came when he was young and it was a one punch knockout. It was one shot and that kind of, it wasn't like he took a sustained beating. I still remember Kenito Henson's call that fight. His eyes are crossed. His eyes are crossed. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like, you know, really like it's Pacquiao, because Pacquiao had this very aggressive devil may care style. And I think that sometimes the only way to get someone to calm down is to put a, a right hand in their mouth. And that's sort of what Tor Campo did. Mm. Next on our list is Med going Sing Surat 3K Battery. Ryan, this guy has always been marketed as the guy who defeated Manny Pacquiao by way of third round TKO in September of 1999. I know Manny struggled to make weight for this fight and eventually lost the belt on the scales. Do you think the fight could have played out differently if it happened in a different weight class, or let's say Manny had a good weight cut. Well, the thing with Manny is that like he was a growing fighter and, you know, uh, it was only going to be so long that he was going to be able to stay at 112. So uh, he was always fighting on borrowed time. Uh, so I, I think that he kind of went into the ring, like, you know, dead drain. I remember um, uh, his trainer at the time uh, was telling me that, that Manny was like bone dry, couldn't get out the, you know, mm. the, uh, the way, the water out of him. So there was no way he can make 112. Mm. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, it was a Filipino who had avenged that. It was uh, Malcolm Tunicao yeah. who eventually uh, avenged that defeat for Pacquiao. But then Tunicao's uh, title reign ended early as well and launched, the career of a, another great Thai fighter, Pong Siklik Wanjong Khan. Next on our list is the legendary Eric Morales. We all know Manny won the last two fights in their trilogy, but can you say, Ryan, that the first fight with Eric Mora- Morales were in Manny lost by a unanimous decision in March of 2005 was the turning point of his career and really brought out the best in the Pac-Man? I think so, because it, it kind of forced Manny to uh, diversify his attack. Like, you know, he started throwing more of a right hook. Um, and, and now Manny has a pretty good right hook, you know, and I think you could point to the Morales fight uh, mm-hmm. to show that, because that was a real weakness in him. Mm-hmm. Like, if you got over to Manny's right, you really could, you know, there wasn't a whole lot he could do. Like, he had a jab, but it was jab was just to throw the left hand. And you would already know what he was going to do after he threw the jab. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I remember uh, asking Pacquiao about that, you know, about the, the 12th round specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when Morales turns to Southpaw, I'm like, what were you thinking then? And he said, I wish he had done it sooner. Mm-hmm. Next on our list, Timothy Bradley. The first fight between Manny Pacquiao and Timothy Bradley has been up for debate till this day. Ryan I want you to play the devil's advocate. 
Why do you think those two judges merited the fight in favor of Bradley when they faced each other in June of 2012? Oh, because they don't know what they're looking at. Uh, they're watching a different fight, and yeah. uh, I mean, it was, it was a clown show. That you know, what what those judges did was a disgrace. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of the most controversial decisions mm-hmm. uh, in recent boxing history, mm-hmm. and uh, nothing makes people doubt the integrity of the sport quite like that next on our list no need for introduction well but we're still gonna mention his name Juan Manuel Marquez no questions asked Ryan this was hands down the biggest knockout win of 2012 and it was the most excruciating defeat of Manny Pacquiao I know the standing of the rivalry between Marquez and Pacquiao is two wins for Manny, one for Marquez, and one draw. But with that knockout win, is it safe to say that Marquez got the last laugh in that rivalry? Um, yeah, I I think that you know it did, and, and it's it's Marquez is like, oh, I got the win, I don't need to fight this guy anymore. No, it's fine. Uh, and Manny wanted the, the the fifth fight, but you know Marquez is like, no, it's cool, I got the win. That's that's all I wanted. Uh, I was there at that fight. I was ringside, and I remember. Uh, Manny falling, and I didn't even watch. I didn't even see the punch. I didn't watch the count. All I knew the fight was over when I saw Marquez's hands go up. Right, um, but I was sitting at ringside, and I remember um, just before um, the fight was about to start. All of a sudden, I had to use the restroom. I'm like, I can't get up now. I got to watch this thing. Like, hopefully, it'd be a kind of boring fight so that you know I don't have to use the restroom. But like, it was one of the greatest fights ever, and um, that was probably the knockout, uh, one of the greatest knockouts in boxing history. Not just for how um, it looked, but the, the significance of it. It was the significance. It was really like you know one of the the best fighters in the world getting knocked out cold. You know, maybe the best fighter in the world getting knocked out cold. So it was. Yeah, and I remember the next morning, Manny uh, still hosted his church service, and yeah. and uh, he said something like, oh, "Better luck next time." Like, well, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Another guy on the list, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Ryan, you're also there at the MGM Grand to watch that fight. It remains it as yeah, it's it, it was you. It was you. <laughs> I was doing it remotely in Manila. Uh, it remains as the highest grossing. Uh, about in history, but many felt that the fight didn't live up to the expectations. But do you believe that it, it wouldn't be the impression if both men fought five years earlier? I think perhaps. I think, you know, it would have been, um, uh, or Manny would have had a better chance. Mm-hmm. I saw that when I was watching the fight, what shocked me, not really shocked me, but like it was noticeable is that Manny was just a little too small compared to Floyd. Floyd was a little bit bigger. Um, so when Floyd did get hurt, he was able to recover uh, because he was, you know, not getting hit by a much larger man. Uh, but Manny, I thought that, uh, you know, first off, uh, his shoulder, I think that that really hurt him because he wasn't able to really snap a right hook. And, you know, yeah. And I do believe he was really hurt because I remember I was sitting in the, I was in the gym one day with him right after that fight, you know, a couple months later. And, uh, and, and, and Freddie was trying to get him to throw a combination and finish with a, with a hook. And he was finishing with a jab instead, right? Like, you know, usually it's like a, a hook and roll. He was throwing a jab and then trying to get out to the side. And then Freddie asked him, why are you like, you know, why are you not throwing the hook? He's like, oh, that's how I got hurt last time. Hmm. And, and, and Freddie's like, you're not still worried about that, are you? You know, so I know that that was a real injury. And anyone who says otherwise, they're like, you know, ridiculous. Hmm. Next on our list, the famous or infamous Jeff Horn. Oh, there, my was, <laughs> there was controversy in, the, in this fight, obviously. I have two questions for this one. Two questions, Ryan. Why wasn't Jeff Horn able to ride on the momentum of that quote-unquote win? Still, a win is a win. Second, why was it easy for Manny Pacquiao to move on from that fight we, we all know that he still got a couple of wins after that, and also he won a title. Oh, uh, I would say uh, the first um, answer to the first question is that, uh, you know, there, Jeff Horn had uh, the, this other business to handle by the name of Terrence Crawford. Mm-hmm. And uh, the second that fight was announced, I was like, oh, geez. Yeah. You know, like, 
I just give up the belt, you know, like yeah. what are you doing, yeah. man? Like kneel the, down the, and give it. Yeah. Like, you know, just do it, do a Shawn Michaels, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, just like just smile. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that that was always going to end badly. Um, anyone could have picked that fight. And I, I, I remember sitting down and watching that fight and just knowing exactly what was going to happen. Like I, the, the fight had already played out of my mind and it was just as bad as it was going to be. Um, the, you know, uh, and then the answer to the second fight is, you know, the fight happened in Australia, Who, you know, I don't even know if like you know, the, the TV signals got over to the rest of the world. It's so far away from everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was at that fight too. Uh, and <laughs> I remember, um, you know, I was not sure if I was going to cover that fight, but I really wanted to see a kangaroo and a koala. <laughs> and that was really like the big part of it. I was like, Oh yeah. Like in the last second I was like, yeah, I'm going to go there. Um, and it was like, it was funny because it was like so far of a flight. And I'm like, the Philippines is supposed to be on the same side of the world. Yeah. I was Australia and it was still a really long flight. So I was just like, man, like Australia should really like try to pull itself closer to the rest of the world. If uh, they want people to watch their boxing matches. Um, but yeah, I think that Pacquiao, uh, I thought that Pacquiao pulled out that fight. Um, and you know, it is what it is. I remember a couple other guys. Uh, uh, I remember a uh, uh, Hooper. Uh, I forget his first Darren Hooper. I think his name is, uh, he got a really bad bogus decision. He was a local fighter, a local Olympian. They gave him a really bogus decision uh, on the undercard. And I was like, oh, uh, well, we know what's going to happen now. <laughs> Last on our list, your Dennis Ugas. Ryan, if Manny Pacquiao decides to return to boxing, depending on the results of the May 2022 election, let's put it that way. Do you think it will be best for Manny? Or do you think it will be, be-, it will be-, be-, it will be best? for him to move on from your Dennis Ugas, like what he did with Jeff Horn. Oh, you mean uh, your Dennis the Menace Ugas? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, Manny probably wouldn't need to fight Ugas again. I I, I don't think that there's a, a whole lot of much to gain because I, you know, I mean, even for Ugas, like Ugas won that fight and it wasn't like the star turning, you know, thing. It's not like everyone's like talking about, oh, we need to see your Dennis Ugas right now. We need to see him in a big fight. Yeah. He's got to be on view. Um, I think it'll be almost sort of like the Jeff Horn thing where it's just like, oh, there he is. Um, PBC, I think that they, uh, I mean, what are they going to do? Like, cause Errol Spence is still injured. So they don't really know where, which direction the division is going to turn. Uh, Terrence Crawford is fighting Sean Porter. You know, it's just like Ugas, you know, is a very good prize fighter. And unfortunately with the way that the, the sports marketing works, that's not all it takes. So um, I don't think that uh, Pacquiao, there's a huge clamoring to see Pacquiao and against Ugas. I don't think there's a huge clamoring to see Pacquiao in the ring again, period. But if he's going to fight, I think he should fight someone lesser. I think he should, you know, maybe go after. Manageable. Yeah, someone manageable, like, you know, like a, like a squash match. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, like the kind of guys that ride back when they're trying to build him up. Just have him, like, go out there and, like, do the shell shock on, you know, Pacquiao, man. Whatever. Just feed him more. Anyway, yeah, yeah, feed Pacquiao more. That's all it is. <laughs> For our next segment, we turn it over to our colleague, Boyet Season. Thanks, Nissi and Ryan. Oh, mga karounder, kamusta na kayo? Alam nyo man na may nag-message sa akin na kung pwede daw ay magkwento pa daw ako tungkol sa mga ibang mga celebrity boxing stories. At, well, alam nyo naman kami. Paano hilig nyo? Eh, binibigay namin. Kaya dahil sa request na yan, ay ito pa ang isa. Naalala nyo ba ang mga pelikulang uh, Rocky ni uh, Sylvester Stallone? Nga mga kaibigan, may maroon mga tunay na boxer na nandoon sa pelikulang yon At meron din naman na muntik ng mapabilang sa serye ng mga pelikula na yon. Isa dyan sa mga boksingerong natampok, mga kaibigan, ay walang iba kung hindi. Ang The Hands of Stone na si Roberto Duran sa pelikulang Rocky II. Now, this was already Stallone's second foray into the Rocky franchise, but it was Duran's first with the series and in films as a whole. Now, he would have some minor roles uh, like in the movie Harlem Nights, but Rocky II in 1979 marked the first time audiences would see him on the big screen as a character in a movie. 
Now, si Stelvestre Stallone, mga kaibigan, eh, medyo mas malaki ng konti kay Duran, yung panahon na yon, who was a lightweight at that time of the movie. Now, Stallone took in a lot of practice for the Rocky films, but by Rocky II, the actor thought that already, he had already gotten pretty good. Well, apparently, sometime with Roberto Duran, changed his mind completely. At least, uh, you know, medyo tumas yung skill level ni uh, Silvestre Stallone. And uh, it put uh, his, uh, his perspective, kumbaga, against a, a world champion. But it meant a lot to him that he was able to spar against one of the greatest boxers of all time. Now, Sylvester Stallone admits to taking a beating at the hands of Roberto Duran during his intense training for that role in Rocky II back in 1978. Medyo may confidence na makibigan si Stallone nung nakipag-sparring session na siya with Duran having spent quite a while in boxing training himself but ended up on the losing side when the Panamanian champion decided to show off his impressive boxing skills. Now, Sylvester Stallone's Rocky Balboa, his character, Rocky Balboa, faced quite a challenge with Roberto Duran. He had to build uh, his strength uh, to knock opponents out and his endurance to be able to stay on his feet. Now, Duran forced the character, Rocky Balboa, to face off against sheer speed and agility. The sparring matchup allowed Duran to show off his lightning fast speed in a controlled setting for uh, the character of Rocky Balboa and, of course, uh, Sylvester Stallone. Now, nung kinuna ng iksenang ito for Rocky II during the last months of 1978 at the Main Street Gym in Los Angeles in the United States, Stallone was feeling pretty confident about his boxing abilities. But that was before he faced the likes of Roberto Duran who would accumulate 103 wins in a career of 119 fights. Now, sa isang interview sa Talk Sport in 2014, si Stallone ay tinanong kung interesado siya makaspar si Bernard Hopkins. Para sa inyo na hindi familiar kay Bernard Hopkins, si Bernard Hopkins, mga kaibigan, ay isa ring world champion. The undisputed middleweight uh, champion from 2001 until 2005. And he was also the lineal light heavyweight champion from 2011 to 2012. And is one of the most celebrated boxers over the last 30 years. Ngayon, dun sa tanong nyo, diba, sinabi ko sa inyo na tinanong si uh, Silvestre Stallone kung gusto niyang uh, makasparing ito si Bernard Hopkins. Ang sagot ni Stallone sa tanong na yon ay simple-simple sa wikang English. Sabi niya, no, I've already learned my lesson from Roberto Duran. Now, the respect for Duran extends beyond the world of cinema, mga kaibigan. Now, Duran, you know, may, 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 may kayabangan na ng konti. Sabi ni Roberto Duran, Mike Tyson, that he was Mike Tyson before Mike Tyson came into the boxing world. Now, para sa inyo mga fans ni Roberto Duran, merong pelikula, mga kaibigan, tukol sa kanyang buhay na pinamagatang Hands of Stone na pinungunahan ng mga artistang sina Edgar Ramirez, si Usher, you see here, si Usher Raymond, at ang napakagaling na si Robert De Niro. Now, send us your comments and suggestions on our Round by Round All Boxing Facebook page for more stories and more kwento. Hanggang sa muli, mga kaibigan, maraming salamat. Now, back to Nisi and Ryan. Thanks, Poyet. And that's the final bell for today's episode of Round by Round presented by Eastern Communications. I'm Nisi Kasiano. And I'm Ryan Sangalia. We're on Facebook at 9 p.m. Monday through Friday and on our YouTube channel right after. So like, follow, share, and subscribe now. And also, don't forget to hit the notification bell to get notified about the latest news and the fearless views in the world of boxing. Boyet Season, Attorney Ed Tolentino, and Bill Velasco are working the fights for you tomorrow. So catch them on the next Round by Round All Boxing, All Filipino, All the Time. See you tomorrow.